Here we go. Week 20. You know where we will be in about six weeks? <laughs> Week 26. Yeah, halfway through. And if you've made it this far, wonderful. You are just doing great. And if you've just joined us for the first time, that's okay too. Hang in. And whatever you missed, you can catch uh, next year. Right? Because you can do this every year. And it's a great thing to do, reading through the Bible in a year. So we're at week 20, and we're covering 1 Samuel 15 through 28. Some really unbelievably interesting stuff about David. I didn't like last week. It was Saul. I don't like Saul. And we're going to get rid of Saul this week. <laughs> and then uh, John, uh, my favorite gospel, Gospel of John, um, a little bit more spiritual in emphasis than the others. Obviously, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke are not chopped liver. In Psalm 110 to 117, and a little bit in Proverbs 15, Proverbs 15, 8 to 23. Now, you know, if you load the podcast on a USB stick, of course, about the, the, any way you listen to it, you can do this. If you don't want to read the Old Testament, then you just skip through that. You know, uh, on the USB stick or whatever you're listening. If it's iTunes, Google Play, Libsyn, uh, whatever, just skip ahead and listen to what you want to hear from John. Or read John and then listen to the podcast and you'll get through whatever the Old Testament portion is. You could do that. Now I've got a good friend of mine. He keeps keeps saying I should I should do a daily one. Uh, I should do like just I don't know Old Testament or just New Testament. He he thinks they're too long and they are. But he's not listening anyway. So what difference does it make? <laughs> so anyone who really wants to know the Bible, they can listen to the whole thing. Or if they don't make it all the way through, then, you know, start again next week. All right. Last week, I didn't explain the end of John 4. That was one of the signs. Remember we talked about the seven signs or miracles, whatever you may call them. Um, they're called signs in John. There were seven of them. And so John 4, 54 was the end of the story of Jesus healing long distance. Did you know we could do that? Of course, God always heals long distance, right? From heaven to earth. But in this case, Jesus healed the son of a nobleman, may have been a centurion, whatever, he healed him. That was his second big miracle after changing the water into wine. And the people who saw the miracle on the other end of the miracle, uh, when the father came home, it was like, oh, yeah, that's when Jesus did that same time. And I've heard stories, you know, sometimes it's uh, missionaries, but it could be just regular lay people that have prayed. And then the miracle takes place like hundreds of miles away, but it's at the same time. And so I guess sometimes it, it impresses us more when you hear a missionary tell a story like that. But anyway, and then we talked about having a heart for God, and this past week, someone said to me, well, what is worship? And off the top of my head, I, I probably a good answer. I think, if you have a better one, let me know. 
Um, it's a person's heart attitude to God. And when they submit to God, they're fully committed with all of their heart, then that is, I think, worship. So it's not, you, you don't have to go dancing up and down and, you know, praying in tongues or standing on your head and singing and screaming. I mean, you can, but you don't have to. It's a heart attitude before God. And I don't think I, I tied this in. I should have. I had a lesson on having a heart for God. And I should have tied it in to what Jesus said in John 7 that we covered last week. That it says the Holy Spirit will flow from the hearts of those who trust him, or who worship him. That was like around 737. All right, now this week, I want to talk about where we're going to end up in the Old Testament, chapter 28, because it's a really interesting story, and it raises a couple of really good questions. Was Saul saved? That's a good question. And Saul visited like a witch, a medium, like a witch. And she conjured up Samuel, who had already passed on to the Lord. So that brings up a question, was it really Samuel? Now, I'll cover that in a few minutes. I do think all the indications in that scripture are that it was actually Samuel talking to Saul from heaven, and God allowed that. But was he saved? He did some really goofy things in his life. And so, you know, we have to wonder, was he actually saved? Well, here's a consideration. I noticed that Saul had prophesied a bunch on several different occasions. In fact... You know, one saying was Saul had killed his thousands, but David had killed his ten thousands. But the the other saying about Saul was that it appeared that maybe he was among the prophets being a king. So in 1 Samuel 10, uh, it says in verse 6, the Spirit of the Lord will come mightily, on Saul, and he will prophesy with a group of prophets, and he will be changed into another man, which is another question. If he's changed in into another man, would he be beside himself? Okay, bad joke. Then in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 10, it says, they came to the hill there. Behold, a group of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came upon him mightily. Remember, I've been saying it over and over again. In the New Testament, in the age of grace, the church age, when someone trusts Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of them. Romans 8, verse 9 but in the Old Testament, sometimes people were blessed with having the Spirit of God come upon them. So on the outside of them, the Holy Spirit comes on them for power. But in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit dwells inside of us. And then we're commanded in Ephesians 5, like 18, that we are supposed to be filled with the Spirit. Now, why would we continually have to be commanded to be filled with the Spirit? It's because we leak. <laughs> That's why we sin, and we're not filled with the Holy Spirit. So, you know, it's always a good thing, probably every day, asking God to fill us with the Spirit. Anyway, the Spirit came upon Saul, and it came, about, it came about when all who knew him previously saw that he prophesied. Now, with the prophets, 
that the people said to one another, What has happened to the son of Kish? That was Saul's father's name, not to be confused with Kanish, which is a really tasty Jewish um, pastry. Anyway, uh, Saul also, is Saul also among the prophets, they asked. Okay, I don't know if it's a pastry or it's, it's doughy. All right. First Samuel 10:13, and when he had finished prophesying, he came to the high place. So it mentions it again. And then in chapter 19, Saul sent messengers to, to take David. We're going to find out about the tension between David and Saul. That's an understatement. He was wanting to kill him badly. He wanted to kill David because he was fleshly, and David was of God and had a heart for God. And that's what we see in Scripture. We'll we'll get to that. But when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying with Samuel standing and presiding over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. Actually, it happened three times. And And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. Then Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. So they were sent out to kill David and see how God protects people who are standing for him. I mean, I get nervous sometimes when people come against me. David sure did. We're going to see that in a moment. But anyway, three times he sent people out to kill David, and they ended up prophesying. He proceeded there to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also, so that he he went along prophesying continually until he came to Naoth and Ramah. So Saul started prophesying again. He prophesied before Samuel laid down naked, which is not completely unheard of. Ezekiel did something like that. And all that night, and therefore they say, is Saul also among the prophets? Here's what Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And what did Jesus say to them? Abscon, take off, go away. They don't make it to heaven. That used to really scare a friend of mine who was a charismatic pastor. And it should, because it's not the gifts of the the Spirit. Normally, you know, that's what Christians have. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 says, To each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. But apparently, you know, um, Pharaoh was able to duplicate some of Moses' miracles. Remember that? So in other words, what I'm saying is, just because Saul prophesied didn't mean he was saved. And you can determine, I report, you decide, and you can figure out if Saul is going to be in heaven or not. If he is in heaven, I figure there's a corner there or maybe we won't even see them. <laughs> Exaggerating. You know, we get to this guy named Doug, D-O-E-G. You know, I I know one Doug who, who I still have a scar on my back from him, and another Doug that is an unbelievable blessing to me. Anyway, here's another uh, really interesting passage, and it's in your reading for this week. Caiaphas. Can you spell Caiaphas? I couldn't, because I couldn't pull them up in my software. C-A-I-A-P-H-A-S. The high priest. When Jesus was taken to, to trial. He was the high priest, and he said to, to people who could hear him, You know nothing at all. 
nor do you take into account that it is expedient for you that one man die for the people and that the whole nation not perish. What he meant was that Jesus should die so uh, Israel would remain intact because he was afraid that if Jesus became king, that the Romans would attack them and wipe out all of the Jews. That's kind of, he was thinking like a fleshly guy. He wasn't saved. I'm pretty sure he wasn't saved. And so it's interesting that that's what he said. It'd be better for Jesus to die for the people. But that turned out being uh, turned out to be a prophecy that Jesus would die for all people. Verse 51 of John 11, he did not say this on his own initiative, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was going to die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but in order that he might also gather together into one children of God, who are scattered abroad. So the gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, for instance, and they're also in Ephesians 4 and Romans 12 and 1 Peter 4, uh, but those don't save you. That's, in fact, has nothing to do really with whether you're spiritual or not. Galatians 5 Verses 22 and 23, the fruit of the Spirit, those are what indicate whether you're spiritual or not. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Did I get them all? Can you check on that? I think I got them. All right. So May 14th through 20th, that's what we're covering And one thing that we need to understand is this relationship, in quotes, air quotes, between Saul and David. God uses, of course, unbelievers to attack us and to help us increase and our grace and love and character. But sometimes unbelievers, or believers, rather, can come against us, and God uses them. Can you believe that? I certainly can believe that happened in my church. And I came across this quote from A.W. Pink about a guy called Thomas Scott, So you know about when Pink lived, because he died in 1952, and Thomas Scott died in 1870. So Pink is quoting Thomas Scott, who was a Protestant minister in Canada. And here's what happened to this poor guy. And a lot of, of the people who did it were probably believers, but just really carnal and fleshly. They shot him several times and put him in a coffin and left him there to die. That's what they did. They put him in a coffin and left him there to die. Now, long before that happened, or some period of time before that happened, he didn't know that was going to happen to him. But he said this, The believer's progress must be gradual. His faith and his graces must be proved and his pride subdued before he can properly endure any kind of prosperity. And he means spiritual prosperity. And for these, although material would also be true, and for these purposes the Lord often employs the perverseness of his brethren without their knowledge or contrary to their intention. They don't know what they're doing, and there's a bunch of them. Trust me. In the professing church, few honor those whom the Lord will honor. Before Jesus came and in each succeeding generation, the very builders have rejected such as heaven intended for eminent situations. 
You can tell he wrote in the 1800s, right? And his servants must be conformed to him. In other words, we have to be like Jesus. Ambition, jealousy, envy, and other evil passions cause men to conceal their real motives under plausible pretenses. So they may act like they're being righteous and they think they're doing God's will, but they're not. The believer's wisdom, however, consists in waiting quietly and silently under injuries and in leaving God to plead his cause, except it be evidently his duty to be active. In other words, Christians should shut up and hold their tongue, usually, unless God says, say something. Remember, uh, Jesus was like a, uh, a sheep to the slaughter and was silent. He didn't say much. He said a few things. He didn't say much. All right, we get into the Old Testament. This chapter is, I call, Agog at Agag. Agag was the king of the Amalekites. One preacher called it uh, hacking Agag to pieces. You're going to find out why. He attacked the Jews mercilessly, and so uh, Saul went out to put him in check, as was God's will, and instead of wiping him out completely, which he was supposed to do, and he, he did that again in another place too, another time, but Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fatlings, the lambs, and all that was good, and were not willing to destroy them utterly. But everything despised and worthless that they utterly destroyed. So they left the good stuff, and they they killed off the bad stuff, animals, etc. So the word of the Lord came to Samuel, and he said, in verse 11 of 1 Samuel 15, I regret that I have made Saul king. Now that brings up a question, right? How can God regret, regret that he did something? He's the one that wanted Saul anointed as king. So could God have made a mistake? No, he didn't make a mistake. He's omniscient. So when anyone brings up that question, it drives me nuts, you know, that God could repent. It says that in scripture. But what what it means is, from our viewpoint, it would seem that way. And I'm sure God has feelings about it. But he does what he does, and he knows what he's going to do, so he can't change his mind. That's the question. Could God change his mind? No, he he can't change his mind ultimately because he's omniscient. So if you're omniscient and you know everything, how do you change your mind? You can't. That drives me nuts when some people say that. Anyway, I regret that I have made Saul king. For he has turned back from following me and has not carried out my commands. And Samuel was distressed, he should have been, and cried out to the Lord all night. Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, and it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, then turned and proceeded on down to Gilgal. Samuel called to Saul, and Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord, I have carried out the command of the Lord. This follows under uh, the category of Jeremiah 17, 9. The heart is deceitful above all things, and who can understand it? In verse 14, Samuel said, What then is the bleeding of the sheep in my ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? How can I hear animals here if you if you wiped everything out like you're supposed to? That is a perf- uh, a well known quote, by the way. First Samuel fifteen fourteen. Saul said, "They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, but the rest we have utterly destroyed." Makes uh, excuses for himself. Do you do that? 
not not a good thing. You're going to find out it was really not a good thing for Saul. Then Samuel said to Saul, wait and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And Saul said, well, let me hear it. And 1517, Samuel said, Is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribes of Israel, and the Lord anointed you over Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they were exterminated like bugs? Why then do you not obey the voice of the Lord? but rushed upon the spoil and dig what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul made his excuse to Samuel, well, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission. And he goes on, and but peep the people. It's the, you know, the people's fault. Remember what Adam did when he was in trouble? This is a woman made me do it. Yeah, the devil made me do it. That's what... Uh, uh, Flip Wilson used to say, Samuel, verse 22, as the Lord is much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And I'm afraid a lot of Christians today, they make up their own religions, they, they make up what they think God wants them to do, and then they sacrifice for the Lord, in air quotes, and they're really not sacrificing for the Lord, and they're not doing what God wants them to do. Like, okay, well, read the Bible. That would be one. Verse 23, for rebellion is as the sin of divination, and insubordination is as iniquity and idolatry, because you have rejected the word of the Lord he has also rejected you from being king. So twice Samuel was told, that's it, you're done. And he remained as king for a while, just persecuting David, which I read that quote from Scott to you. That was how David was being built up and had character as a king, courtesy of Saul. Anyway, you can read the rest of it there, but finally, Samuel got disgusted, and he said, bring me Agag, the king of the Amalekites, and Agag came to him cheerfully, thinking he, you know, got, ri got was able to live, actually, was what it boiled down to. He got away with whatever he had been doing. And surely the bitterness of death is past, is what he said. And Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so shall your mother be childless among women. And Samuel hewed Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgag. Gilgag. Now, you know, that's what Saul was supposed to do as king, and Samuel had to do it as a prophet. And the Lord regretted the end of the chapter uh, that he had made Saul king over Israel. Now, he knew what he was doing when he put Saul in, but emotionally he was upset about the whole thing. But it led to David being anointed as king. And this is kind of interesting. When I was in cemetery, seminary, uh, one of my favorite professors brought this out in the class and I asked him a follow-up question and I said how could God cause Samuel to lie and he, he didn't he didn't have the answer he said well go and read it and you'll see sure enough it does look that way that the Lord told Samuel to anoint David and Samuel said well if I do that um, Saul's going to find out and he's going to off me. So what the Lord said to him was take a heifer and if anyone asks you, just say, I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Well, anyway, that was true. <laughs> 
derive what you will uh, from that in your own ethical system. I think, though, you know, it's like uh, years ago when I was young, uh, I was working at a Christian radio station, and one of the pastors kept coming in to do, uh, you know, one of his programs, and I was engineering it for him. And he saw my resume. I was applying for a job, and he said, what do you have this stuff about you that, you know, isn't that favorable? So well, I'm just being honest. He said, you can leave it off. It's all right. <laughs> and I think that's kind of like this. Um, it just Saul wasn't or Samuel wasn't lying exactly. He just was leaving out, you know, well, yeah, I am here to anoint David, but I'm also here to sacrifice a heifer. <laughs> anyway, you look at that and and see what you think. It's really, I think, pretty cool. I think, you know, follow it's, it follows under the umbrella of be wise as serpent and innocent as doves. You know, God doesn't want us to be just stupid. <laughs> That's what it amounts to. First Samuel sixteen seven, that uh, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. So Saul was tall, but uh, David maybe wasn't as good looking as him, despite what Michelangelo, you know, put together in a statue. A uh, man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. See, there's the heart thing again. Verse 7, 1 Samuel 16. All right, uh, you can continue read on there. The, Saul, uh, the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. And the antidote was for to have David bring his harp and play for Saul. And you'll read about that in that chapter. And whenever the evil spirit from God came to Saul, David would take the harp and play it with his hand. Saul would be refreshed and be well, and the evil spirit would depart from him. In the next chapter, you probably already know this story. Of this guy. He was not a New York giant. He was not a San Francisco giant. He was Goliath. And so you may wonder, you know the story, right? You must know the story. First Samuel 17, verse 40, though, you may come across this and find out that David took five smooth stones from the brook and put it in his shepherd's bag that he took with his sling. And you knew how he offed Goliath. But why did he have five stones? Well, he had five stones because he used one for Goliath, which was efficacious. It worked. He fell on his head, and then David cut his head off and kept it as a memorial and took it to, to Saul. But um, the other four, he thought his brothers, Goliath had four brothers, and he figured that they were going to come and try to kill himself, David. That's why you have four more. It's not like he was going to miss on number one, two, or three. No, it was for his brothers. And after that, the Israelites went and defeated the people of Goliath after that. Dare I say it was Gath. All right, verse Samuel 18, we'll find out about uh, Saul's son, which we already have heard about him, Jonathan. And he and David were just the closest of friends. A beautiful thing. Unfortunately, Jonathan 
died with his father not too long from verse 18. And Saul, fortunately, was really bad at um, javelin throwing. Really, really bad. He tried to pin David more than once. (laughs) Verse 11 of 18, he escaped from his presence twice, David did. And Saul also tried to throw the spear at Jonathan and missed, thank goodness. And you'll find out the price that David paid to get Saul's daughter, which people differ on um, how to pronounce her name, because it looks like Michael, and it probably is Michael. I heard a Southern Baptist pastor down in Georgia, and uh, he pronounced it, I think, with a Southern accent. Michal. Or he was listening to the Beatles. I'm not sure. All right. Then, chapter 19 of 1 Samuel, we find out about the dummy. (laughs) Reminds me of uh, the movie Animal Crackers with the Marx Brothers. And if you don't know about the Marx Brothers... Oh, my goodness. You need to watch them. And that's probably my favorite, maybe, movie of all time, Animal Crackers. And you'll know about the dummy. All right. Uh, The dummy, in this case, was Saul was trying to kill David. And David was Michael's... See, it does sound weird to be, you know, married to a beautiful woman and her name is Michael. But whatever. So, um, what Michael did was put a dummy in her bed so that when Saul's messengers went to find, came to find David, uh, you know, there was the dummy there. So anyway, you can read about that. And then you'll find out about the arrows. You can zip through first. Samuel 20, all it was was a way to signal to David, who was hiding from Saul by this point. And so Jonathan sent arrows that David could see, and his um, armor bearer is probably who it was, uh, didn't know what was going on. Anyway, you can read that. Then you'll find about find out about Abigail and about Doug or, or Doug, who was just a first class creep. You find him in Psalms, actually. Psalm forty one nine. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That may be an allusion to Doeg. And, you, you know, maybe you should just pronounce it Doeg. To, to not confuse it with some good people you know named Doug. Although, there's some others too. Anyway, you know, Jesus used that same scripture about Judas. And Doug was not a nice guy. Anyway. So, you know about Doug. And then, in that same chapter, we find out that what David did, and I don't think it came from faith, but anyway, he knew that Saul was just on his heels trying to find him and kill him. And so what he did was hide amongst the Philistines, the avowed enemy of the Jews. And here's what he did, which was crazy. You know, like literally it was crazy. He disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. He was acting nuts when he hid amongst the Philistines, because they're the enemies of the Jews. And so he acted like nuts, so, you know, they wouldn't use him as a soldier or whatever. 
or, you know, just revel in him being captured. So then in the next chapter, 1 Samuel 22, the king said to Doug, you turn around and attack the priests. And Doug the Edomite turned around and attacked the priests, and he killed that day 85 men who wore the linen ephod. So that's the breastplate that the priests wore. The holy men, good guys. He killed 85 of them on the orders of Samuel, or Saul rather, than David said about the inhabitants of Kayla, he had protected them, and uh, he asked the Lord what he should do, and the, he said, well, are they going to surrender me to Saul? And the Lord said, yeah, they are. That's in chapter 23. So now you've got chapter 23 down. There isn't a lot there. In First Samuel 24, we have the story about Saul going into a cave um, to relieve himself. That's what it says. So the men of David said, well, you, here's your chance. Go in while he's distracted. You can go in and off him. But he didn't. He went in because that was the anointed of the Lord, and he respected that, even though he had been anointed of the Lord by Samuel. But he, he went in there and he cut the edge of Saul's robe off. <laughs> and he showed it to him. And he said, far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord. The Lord's anointed, is what David said of Saul, to stretch out my hand against him. And so, of course, Saul was embarrassed. You can read about that. And then it happens again, basically. Then in the next chapter, 1 Samuel 25, is the story of Abigail, who's not only pretty, she was intelligent and a believer. And she had a rotten husband. So God took, about, took, uh, took care of her. She ends up with David. But... You can read the story, and what you need to know is that her husband's name, Nabal, that means fool. <laughs> he, She married a fool. I don't know how that happened. Maybe it was arranged by her parents. I don't know. But And then the other thing you need to understand is that he almost, he and his all his servants and men, were almost offed by uh, David. And Abigail intervened. You'll read the story. And then when she told him the next day, after he had awoken from a drunken, a drunken stupor, uh, it says his heart died within him. He became as a stone. In other words, he had a stroke. And ten days later... Verse 38 says the Lord struck Nabal, and he died. He was a fool. Speaking of fools, meanwhile, back at the ranch with, uh, with Saul, same thing basically happens again. Uh, Saul and his bodyguard are all sleeping, and Abishai, David's General said, you know, here's, you, you got a chance again. Get rid of this dude. And so David took the spear and the jug of water from beside Saul's head. And no one knew about it because they were in such a, a sound sleep. <laughs> so this is the Lord hinting to Saul, you know, straighten up your ways. And he didn't. Pay attention. David, meanwhile, uh, with the Philistines, attacked the Negev. And so when you come across that, what it means is the south. So it was the southern parts uh, around Judah. And Judah is where David became king. We'll get into all of that. 
the northern kingdom was Saul's, but David you know, hadn't become king of, of anywhere at this point. But he would go raiding so that Achish, the king of the pagans, the Philistines, thought that David was out serving him. But actually, David was out killing the enemies of Israel. So when you read that, that's what's going on, because it's not real clear, I don't think. Ziklag, I like to say that Ziklag was the area given to David and other kings that followed him. Then you get into that story I've kind of told you about already. Uh, I call it a small medium at large. I'm guessing she was small. It was a witch. It was a medium. And she had been kicked out by Saul because he had extricated all of the um, mediums and witches. And yet she was still around and Saul didn't know what he was supposed to do. He didn't have guidance from the Lord. Of course, he was separated from the Lord. In Leviticus 19.31, if you want the scripture, indicates that witchcraft and that sort of thing is frowned upon as an understatement in the Old Testament. So, Samuel is brought forth by this medium, although God did it, and he says, why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? Verse 15 to 28. So the indication was that it really was Samuel, and I basically told you the, the story, except that Samuel told Saul, tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Maybe you were saved then. <laughs> Ended up to heaven. But he sure was carnal and sure fits that quote that I gave you at the beginning of the podcast like two days ago. <laughs> wasn't quite that long ago. All right. Then, uh, because of the words of Samuel, he was afraid. He had no strength in him. He had not eating it, eaten anything. So the woman, the medium, the witch, had a fattened calf. And she quickly slaughtered it. She took flour, kneaded it, and baked unleavened bread from it because Saul needed to eat. Now notice, though, you know, I've talked about the value of vegetarianism or near vegetarianism. They didn't eat a lot of uh, beef. This was a special occasion for the king. And so she slaughtered the calf. All right, chapter of 8 of John, uh, the woman who is found in adultery, several observations there. Um, she was going to be killed, and so they brought Jesus into it, thinking they would put him on the horns of a dilemma. They kept trying that, and were always unsuccessful. And that's the story when Jesus wrote in the sand, and then they started absconding. Remember that? Probably they were writing, he was writing the names of these religious leaders, and they had probably been adulterers. And that's why. So anyway, uh, the famous line, he who is without you, Without sin among you, let him be the first to throw a stone. That's when they left. And no one was left. And so Jesus said to the lady, uh, who's here left? And she said, no one. And Jesus said, I do not condemn you either. Go from now on, sin no more. So apparently she had sinned. But the funny thing is also the observation is there's not a guy there with her. Uh, there's usually two to tango in that sin. Verse eight twelve, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. We cover both the seven I am's and uh, we covered the seven signs, but there's one of the I am's indicating he was God when he says I am. 
throwback to the burning bush. And Jesus says he didn't do anything on his own initiative. Of course, Caiaphas, it was said of him in John that he didn't prophesy on his own initiative, but Jesus never did anything on his own initiative, and that was why he was the perfect representation of the Father. Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. So the Pharisees were asking him, Where is your Father? Now this you may know, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Right? You know that, but what you probably have missed, the verse before, verse 31, Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed him, so it was believers, and he said, if you continue in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. How many believers do you know that read the Bible every day? That's continually, right? How many do you know? I don't know many. In fact, Bible ignorance is prevalent. And I think we're in the end times. But, you know, people don't read their Bibles. There's plenty of them out there. Go to a motel. They're put there for you. You can steal them. It's not stealing because they want you to take them. And then they go out and replenish them. The Gideons do. Anyway... The way you will know the truth and the way you will be free is because you're in the word. That's verse 31 proceeds. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. All right. Don't want to beat a fallen horse. You are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in it. Chapter 8. Verse 44, he's talking to the religious leaders. And I tend to think that, you know, a religious leader like me, you know, think like I do. And they don't. A bunch of them are from the devil and are preach and preach heresy and spread it around. Did Jesus ever sin? Do you know? No, he didn't. It says straight out in Hebrews, but here in John 8.46, which one of you convicts me of sin? It's like a rhetorical question because he hadn't sinned. 8.52, the Jews said to him, now that we know that you have a demon, because he was comparing himself to like Abraham, and he said, um, anyone who keeps my word, he will never taste of death. And when he was speaking pure truth, they accuse him of being demon-possessed. Is that a little bizarre? So in verse 57, chapter 8, Jews said to him, You are not yet 50 years old. Have you seen Abraham? And Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. So there's the I am again. So they knew he wasn't wasn't near 50. He probably was in his lower 30s. Verse chapter 9, 5, this is interesting, where Jesus says, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And what does light do? It helps you to see, right? Helps you to see the truth. And chapter 9 is... The chapter where I thought I was saved, what happened was actually, was years before, I was in a confessional and something just seemed amazingly great. And I came out and I asked someone of that denomination what happened. He had no clue. You determine whether he was of his father the devil or not. He couldn't explain to me what was probably salvation. He didn't know what it was. And then, in John 9, when I was in college, I thought I was led to the Lord because I had no teaching, really, to speak of that was relevant to being saved or to be a disciple. 
So then it seemed I was saved. I was probably entering full-blown into sanctification, the second phase of salvation. Anyway, I've discussed that before and probably will again. There's three phases of salvation, but the first one gets you to heaven. The second one gets you rewards at the Bema seat. I'm not going to get into that. But here in John 9 was a man blind from birth. And then he was able to see because of the miracle Jesus had done. And yet, what happened to him? He got hassled by the fleshly leaders. And that goes back all the way to Cain and Abel. Remember that? Abel brought a sacrifice to God that God accepted. And Cain brought a sacrifice that God did not accept. So then he was jealous of Abel and, of course, killed him. So the first murder in the Bible, early, early, early. And then you have Saul and David are types of Cain and Abel. And here you have these religious leaders coming against Jesus. And so don't be surprised if you commit full-blown on to the Lord and are completely committed and your whole heart and being whole-hearted in your Christian commitment, you know, there's going to be people come against you. Don't be surprised. Anyway, Jesus said, um, well, the man said, who was blind and was healed, answered to the Pharisees, here's an amazing thing. You did not know where he is from, and yet he opened my eyes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure they wanted to hear that. And then he said, since the beginning of time, it's never been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born entired, entirely in sins, and are you teaching us? So they put him out of the temple. <laughs> Amazing, right? Uh, and real similar to what happened to me. I, you know, I asked a religious leader when I was real young what happened to me. I didn't have a clue, although he didn't ask me questions. 9.39, for judgment, Jesus said, I came into the world so that those who do not see may see, and that those who see may become blind. In other words, those who think they know some things, they don't. And they're being blind. They can't see what Jesus was doing and who he was. So the Pharisees said, we are not blind too, are we? And Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we sin, your sin remains because they're big time hypocrites. Verse 41. Well, he said that if you were blind, you would have no sin. But since you say we see your sin reminds, uh, remains. <laughs> reminds me of something my dad used to say when I was a kid. The blind man said, I see, but he didn't. <laughs> All right, think about that. John 10, 7, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. So there's another I am. And then you know this one, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's the abundant life scripture. But right before it says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And then in verse 12, it talks about a hired, a hired hand. It's like a wolf that comes to kill the sheep. And those are the false teachers. There was a pastor in town that because I had to live a ways away from the pastor, the church that I pastored, said I was a hireling. It was odd <laughs> what I was paid, like nothing at that church, that I was in it for the money, but whatever. And then he was dismissed from his church, but it took several years, but he, he was preaching heresy there. No one has taken my life away from me is basically what it says in verse 18 of 10 
but I lay it down on my own initiative. And think about that when you study the scriptures about Jesus and dying, and when he shouted out, it is finished, that's because he let his spirit go. Yeah, okay, a lot of people in Romans uh, helped him along, the Jews, uh, the crucifixion, but he would have been there forever if he didn't release himself from the cross. My sheep know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. 1027. No one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. When you trust the Lord, that is, uh, once saved, always saved. And he says, I and the Father are one. So whatever you see Jesus do, and whatever he, whatever the Father does, it's the same as Jesus doing it. Now, I already uh, covered this about the gods in John 10. And what Jesus was doing, he was alluding to Psalm 82, verse 6, where it says, You are gods, and all of you are sons of the Most High. Nevertheless, you will die like men and fall like any one of the princes. Gods, with small g, was referring to judges and rulers at the time. And so Jesus was taking that and using it to show the Pharisees and whoever was listening to say, well, you, th- you said they were gods, but I am the God with a capital G. And why don't you get it? They didn't get it, though. He eluded their grasp because they were out to get him at this point. A good friend of mine used to say, no good deed goes unpunished. That's an understatement when it went uh, when it's applied to Jesus who died for the sins of the world and for us. Chapter 11 is the story about Lazarus being raised from the dead. There is a scripture for you to read and me- memorize 11:35. You can memorize that. Oh no, you can't. Yeah, you can. Jesus wept. There you go. <laughs> Your verse for the week. John 11:35 Jesus uh, if he had been on ha- on hand Martha thought Lazarus wouldn't have even died but he did die and he'd been uh, bound up you know and prepared for death and behind a rock you know like the way Jesus had been buried and so Jesus hit the scene late in a man's mind, but on time, the way God wanted things. And so he yelled out so Lazarus could hear him come forth, and he did. And he had the wrappings and everything on him. Unbind him and let him go, Jesus said. So, there you go. You've got John, for the most part, for Samuel. Remember, we already covered the end of chapter 11 about Caiaphas. All right, Psalms. 110 is a royal psalm, which means it's about a king, and then it means it's about Jesus. So, verse 1 says, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. That's quoted in Hebrews 113. And in Matthew twenty two forty four, Christ applies it to himself. The Lord is sworn, sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. According to the order of Melchizedek, we, we covered him in Genesis, who was a special type of Jesus back then. And there he's mentioned in that royal psalm. A hymn, Psalm 111. He's given food to those who fear him. So there's a promise. If you're hungry and your uh, cupboards are bare, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Verse 10 in Psalm 111. You know that phrase from studying Proverbs. 112 is a wisdom psalm in the form of an acrostic, which meant that the Jews and the young Israelites, the kids, were supposed to memorize it. 
It's well with the man who is gracious and lends. He will maintain his cause and judgment. He will never be shaken. The righteous will be remembered forever. Help people out. Give them a hand. Psalm 113 is a hymn also. And also an acrostic. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. And Francis Schaeffer used that for a title of one of his books. And uh, an acrostic, what I mean is each letter of the Hebrew alphabet begins a line in a psalm like that. 114 is a hymn again and a thanksgiving of the community or a trust, rather, of the community. The sea looked and fled. The Jordan turned back. He turned the rock into a pool of water, the flint into a fountain of water. So you get the idea of some of the history of Israel covered in that psalm. 115. Now, okay, so that's a trust. It's a trust. All right, it's a trust of the community. Psalm 115, our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. I just love that scripture. God does whatever he wants to do. Now, you know, you make those jokes about, you know, can he lift something, blah, blah, you know, and it's a joke. Yeah, he can't do something that's illogical, but... He does whatever he wants, and that's why we worship him. So that's a hymn and a trust of the people. Psalm 116, I wrote my first song based on that, and almost my last song too. But I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my supplications. So a thanksgiving of the Lord. You know, those are going to be close to a trust, a thanksgiving and a trust. Uh, 116.3, the cords of death encompassed me, and the terrors of Sheol came upon me. That reminds me of the seaweed that got around Jonah's head when he was in the the whale. Seriously, check that out. 116.11, I said in my alarm, all men are liars. And that's not written by a woman. It's written by a man. And they are. Turn on the TV and look at any ad. They're all lies. Like all of them. And, you know, so why do we believe them? Because we want to. (laughs) That's why. We want to get a new car or whatever. We want a hamburger that's dripping with grease. 116.15, one sixteen fifteen. Precious is the sight of the Lord, is the is the death of his godly ones. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his godly ones. Uh, we just buried my father in law not too long ago. That was certainly true there. It's almost starting to to well up thinking about it. It was just a, a wonderful believer in the Lord. Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter in the Bible. See, if you didn't listen this far into the podcast, you wouldn't find that out. It's the shortest chapter. We we uh, found the shortest scripture in English was John 11, um, John 11:35. There's actually a a shorter scripture in the Bible based on the Greek, and I can't remember what it is. Anyway, Psalm 117 is the shortest chapter, and it's right in the middle of the entire Bible. So it's two verses long. Proverbs, just a few to single out. Verse 13, a joyful heart makes a cheerful face. So again, watch Animal Crackers by the Marx Brothers. When a heart is sad, the spirit is broken. Isn't that the truth? And verse 15 kind of repeats that all the days of the afflicted are bad, but a cheerful heart has a continual feast. That's why Philippians 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord, and again I say, Rejoice. 
we sing a song on guitars in uh, in church, probably this Sunday, actually. And it's just based on that, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. He went to a seminar not long ago with my doctor, and he was talking about compulsive thoughts and getting taught in a, caught in a knot and et cetera. And I said, can't you just stop? And he thought about it. You know, do you need drugs or therapy? Can't you just stop? He said, um, yeah, yeah, you can. <laughs> Proverbs fifteen seventeen. you know, I've been singing the praises of vegetables, but we don't eat them. You know, do they have them at McDonald's at all? I don't know. Better is a dish of vegetables where love is than a fattened ox served with hatred. So rich people would have more beef back then, but still it was rare. And it's better to just have vegetables, you know, like Daniel ate with his boys. Um, it's a lot health, more healthy. Hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but the slow to anger calms a dispute. You ever seen that? You ever seen that? Someone who, who gets, there's a bunch of really angry people, and then there's like one person there, and they're calm and speak at a low voice and... Everyone calms down. You ever seen that phenomena? It happens. Proverbs fifteen twenty two. Without consultation, plans are frustrated, but with many counselors, they succeed. That's it. Week 20. Next week, week 21. Check out my blogs, spiritualrants.com. This is Jerry Rothhauser. See you next week. <laughs>